Good evening, everybody, and a big welcome here to tonight's Five by 15. So the question tonight is, should we have stayed at home? It's a question that all of us have wrestled with a lot over the last 18 months, not just because of the pandemic, but also because of climate change. But what does travel mean to us now? Should we do it at all? And whatever way we look at it, it's a great deal more difficult. And there are many people right now trying very hard to travel to different parts of the world. So we're really thrilled tonight to be partnering in the launch of the 157th edition of the wonderful Granta magazine. This one is dedicated to the art of new travel writing and it is called, Should We Have Stayed at Home? Now tonight's event is going to be hosted by William Atkins, who has guest edited this really brilliant edition of Granta. William is the author of The Immeasurable World, A, Des a Desert Journey, and that won the 2019 Stanford Dolman Travel Book of the Year. And next year, we'll see the publication of his book about places of political exile, appropriately called Exiles. This is a theme that does run a lot through many of the pieces in this edition of Granta. And I'm really thrilled to say that if you look online in the chat box, you'll see the details for a 50% off offer for next year's subscription to Granta. I can see Christmas presents coming up, certainly in my book. Now, before we begin, I'll just read you one short quote from William's excellent intro to this collection. The following pieces, if the following pieces can be said to have an overriding characteristic, it's that they take seriously the experience of being a stranger. What does it mean to be an outsider wherever we call home? So with no, nothing further from me, I will slink off into the virtual wings and hand you over to your very capable host, William Atkins. Sit back and enjoy it. And thank you all so much for being with us. Rosie, thank you. Um, nearly 40 years ago, Granta published its first travel writing special. And that edition included Jan Morris, Colin Thubrin, Martha Gellhorn, and Bruce Chatwin. A couple of years ago, Granta invited me to guest edit a new travel writing special issue. I decided fairly early on that we would borrow its title from Elizabeth Bishop's great poem, Questions of Travel. That particular question. That particular question, should we have stayed at home, already felt urgent in 2019, even before our, our current period of, of stasis, when many of us for the first time suddenly had little choice in the matter of whether we stayed at home. One response to Elizabeth Bishop's question can be found in the words of another great American poet, Gary Snyder. And Snyder said, the most radical thing you can do is stay at home. The pieces in this volume are partly about that tension um, between staying at home and leaving home in an era of multiple planetary crises. I want to thank um, 5 by 15 um, for hosting tonight's event and particularly for donating the ticket revenue from this event to Rainbow Migration, uh, a charity that supports LGBTQI plus people through Britain's labyrinthine asylum and immigration system and whose work, um, for reasons I probably don't need to articulate, is, is more important than ever. So our speakers tonight are joining us from uh, the United States, from Berlin, from Mumbai, from Leeds, and they're going to take us to Jamaica, to Afghanistan and Hamburg, to the northern Philippines, and first of all, to Far East Russia. I came to uh, Bathsheba Demuth's work through her extraordinary book, Floating Coast, a, an environmental history of the, the Bering Strait. I'm delighted to be welcoming Bathsheba from Providence, Rhode Island, where she's an assistant professor of history and environment and society at Brown University. And for this issue of Granta, she's written a piece, uh, a really exquisite piece about a journey she made to Chukotka on the Russian Bering Strait. And the piece is called Aptly Mistaking Wales. Bathsheba. 
Thank you so much, Will, and thank you to everyone at 5 by 15. It's such a pleasure to join you um, from Rhode Island. Um, I'm gonna start this evening off by going back a couple of years uh, into pre-pandemic times when I found myself profoundly seasick um, on the Russian side of the international date line, just off the coast of Chukotka in the Bering Sea, looking at whales and looking at gray whales to be particular about it. And in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you roughly why. And the general answer to that question is that I'm a historian, although that might not be an obvious reason to end up seasick on a ship in the Bering Sea. But for several years before that journey to Chukotka, um, I'd been gathering records about gray whales and their meanings all over the world. Um, indigenous Yupik and Chukchi histories transcribed in St. Petersburg, whalers logbooks in New Bedford, Massachusetts, Soviet economic plans in Vladivostok. And I'd also spent a lot of time imagining gray whales. I knew that they were born about 8,000 kilometers south of the Bering Sea along the Baja Peninsula. And I knew that when they're only a few months old, they start to migrate north with their mothers along the edge of the North American continent through waters that are punctuated um, by the noise coming from the ports of Los Angeles and Oakland and Seattle and Vancouver as they swim. And then finally, if you're thinking about things like a whale, things start to get quieter as they cross north of the Aleutian Islands and into the Bering Sea, where they come in the summer to eat clams from the mud on the seafloor that was beneath my ship. And what brought me to that ship off the Chukotka coast in the cold wind, deeply nauseous, was a desire to know more about the relationships between my species and gray whales. And I came to Chukotka because it had hosted centuries of human whale stories. So really, I came north looking for the plot. The particular ship that I was on, the Kapitan Sotnikov, was sailing a regular route from the small village of Laurentia to the slightly less small village of Pravidinia, both of which are on the Chukchi coast. And travel in this part of Russia, if you're an American, is not simple. Alaska is so close that the Russian government considers the entire region to be a special border zone. And that means that foreigners can only travel with a pass that's been approved by layers of bureaucracy, um, including the security services or the FSB. And even then the FSB has lots of questions and interviewed me every couple of days. And in Laurentia, two plainclothes officers spent so long talking to me um, that my friend Giana grumbled, what do they think you're gonna do? Are you gonna steal our damn reindeer? Are you gonna spy on the whales? But as I knew from my time in the archives, New Englanders like myself had once been a kind of robber in Chukotka and what they stole was whales, killed to refine their blubber down into lamp oil. In 1845, commercial ships started killing whales north of Baja, California. And within a few years, the whalers had trailed the gray whales all the way north into the Bering Sea. And I knew from reading these whalers logbooks that gray whales gave very little oil of pretty poor quality and were known to attack um, their hunters so that whalers feared and hated them and called them devil fish or scrags as a result of their tempers. But because commercial whalers at the time were paid their share of a voyage's profits only after the ship made its way back to port, the whalers had every reason to kill any kind of whale they came across. And as a result, only 30 years after the first commercial gray whale hunt, there were only about 4,000 grays left alive. Herman Melville wrote about this in kind of general terms in Moby Dick, how in New England on streets that were lit by blubber, this remorseless havoc was made into a story of triumph, the light by which to read the American plot of progress. When the Capitan Sotnikov reached Pravidinia, I was collected by Nikolai, a guide from Beringia National Park. Nikolai is Chukchi, and for the next week, he took me looking for the signs of whales that his ancestors have been hunting off of this peninsula for thousands of years. 
And we often traveled with Alexei, the driver of the park's tricol, which is the vehicle that looks like a Jeep has crossed with a tractor. And on our first day together, it was very clear to me why we needed this particular four foot tired car to travel around in because the track that we were following sometimes looked vaguely like a road and sometimes was more or less covered with water. And Alexei took a great deal of relish in explaining to me how Americans make roads and Russians make vehicles that do not require roads. And after a jolting hour on this not road, we reached a grassy patch right on the shore of the Bering Sea. And out of the grass rose these clusters of what looked to me like pale kind of weathered beams coming out of the grass. But as we walked out among them, I saw that the beams had been born, that they were the internal architecture of whales that now formed the crumbling walls of half underground houses, some held up inside underground by whale skulls themselves, that people in this place had lived inside the heads of whales. Nikolai told me that the name of this place in Yupik was Ivan, and that people had lived here inside the heads of whales for a thousand plus years. And we walked down to the sea, which along the Bering coast is constrained less and less every year um, by the sea ice, so that there's increasing erosion coming in um, with the summer storms, and it's kind of eroding the embankment that separates the village of Yvonne from the water and exposing the skull foundations of more of these bone houses. And all around at my feet, kind of on the shore were pieces of bone and some of them were clearly tools, old things that had been worked by human hands. And then among them was a Yoplait yogurt container um, with the words on the side still legible, saying fat-free strawberry. As we drove back to Pravidinia from Ivan, the road that we took went through the ruins of a Soviet town called Ureliki, which if you've ever spent any time in the Soviet Union or the former Soviet Union would look really familiar. Concrete apartment blocks, a library, a school. By the time it was built during the Second World War, the New England whaling fleet had been gone from the Bering Sea for decades. But gray whales faced another danger. In the 1930s, the Soviet Union's first factory whale ship, the Aleut, began hunting in the Bering Sea. And after just a few years, the Aleut found very few gray whales to slaughter. By that point, due to the Russian hunting and the Norwegian fleet that was harvesting whales off of Baja, there were only about 2,000 gray whales left in the Pacific. I had, by the time I was in Chukotka, spent hours with the Aleut's newsprint reports and knew that the crew had killed its first whale on the 15th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. And that revolution brought a very new and very clear plot to Chukotka. Inspired by Karl Marx and refined by Vladimir Lenin, it made history into a ladder. Human society moved from hunting and gathering to feudal agriculture to capitalist production. And then finally, socialism would overthrow capitalism's injustices with capitalism's industrial tools. And the result of all this was utopia. But it was not a utopia that required the presence of whales or people in Ivan. The Soviet Union forcibly closed the village and moved all the residents away from the whalebone houses and did not permit them to hunt in their traditional ways. But those traditional ways outlasted the Soviet Union. And I saw how several days after Ivan on a beach north of Pravidinia, where we stopped the tricol, we could see at a distance, a group of men who were clustered around what looked to me like a gray oblong stone. But as we walked toward them, I saw that that stone had died, that the stone was a whale. This whale was one of the nearly 30,000 greys that are now alive, the descendants of those 2,000 survivors of American and Soviet plots. Now, only in these kind of indigenous hunts continue, killing less than 140 whales per year in Russia. And this particular whale was not large, maybe 25 feet long, 
and two Chukchi men gave a curious nod at me and continued lifting sheets of her skin rimmed blubber into the Soviet era trucks parked nearby. I overheard one of them saying what a gift the fat would be for his grandmother because she didn't do well with other kinds of food and that it was whale meat that made her well. The whale smelled like any other dead animal. The whale blood smelled like blood. And Nikolai took out his knife and cut away a few pounds of the dark meat. A gift, he said, nodding to the men, but also to the whale as he handed it to me. And that night I ate the whale in my apartment in Pravedinia. In the time and the place where I was born, I was taught that the right way to consume a whale is with your eyes. In English, we call this whale watching. You, the human being, bear the verb out over the water to the noun that is the whale. I have whale watched off the coast of Massachusetts and Rhode Island, but not for gray whales. They were driven extinct by the, in the Atlantic by European hunters over two centuries ago. But even floating out over the absence of this extinction, whale watching is part of a plot that I learned to call civilization. Yes, industrial whalers had nearly killed off the world's whales, but with knowledge of that destruction, we, always the general we, had put aside such brutal things and left death in the past. In January of 2019, five months after I left Chukotka, gray whales entered what marine scientists call an extreme mortality event. Dead or dying grays stranded from Mexico to Alaska. And by the late fall of 2020, 384 had died. Some of them were struck by ships, but others appeared emaciated. And autopsies found that the whales had stomachs filled with a kind of black dough, a sign biologists say of a body that is digesting itself. And all during this extreme mortality event, I was speaking about whales and Chukotka to audiences around the United States. It was not uncommon for someone to ask, horrified, how it was that I could witness a whale death, let alone how it was that I could eat a whale. So I began warning people at the beginning of my talk about the carnivorous content. But I've come to think that it was the wrong disclaimer and that what I should have said is look at this strawberry yogurt cup. This is your sustenance, you in my audience. It's your appetite and it's mine too. And it's also evidence that you are already traveling out among whales, that you are in their home. The norms that in ended industrial whale slaughter are all to the good, the norms of watching whales rather than killing them by the industrial millions but those norms are not preventing gray whales from eating themselves from the inside out. So perhaps what I should have said is what we call a wealthy society is a condition that separates our appetite and our sustenance from their sources, from the beings who make our bones and our homes. Don't confuse the distance that civilization keeps from death with dying. And I should have told people about that evening on the deck of the Kapitan Sotnikov gripping the bright blue railing, still nauseous, looking out over the sea, and suddenly there was no plot, but the distant water parting in a blasting exhale. And then a second followed, as a gray whale mother and her calf rose up to meet the sun. Thank you. Bathsheba, thank you for your essay. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, the essay is full of glittering images that um, I think will haunt me forever. There's a sentiment towards the end um, that speaks to some of the questions of travel that um, this issue as a whole raises. And Bathsheba writes, the land where you, where you live in close focus might present another way to arrange the fragments of the past into a story. Jason Allen Paisant is a Jamaican poet and nonfiction writer. At the University of Leeds, he's a lecturer in Caribbean poetry and decolonial thought and director of the Institute for Colonial and Post-Colonial Studies. 
his poetry collection, Thinking with Trees, was recently published by Karkinet. Jason's essay for this volume is entitled Primitive Child, and it traces the roots that connect the woods he knew as a child in Jamaica with the woods he discovered as an adult in England. Jason, welcome. Thank you, Will. And uh, again, thanks so much for including me in this extraordinary issue. I want to take you this evening on a journey that begins in the bush and that ends in the park. Uh, it's a story that starts in Coffee Grove, Jamaica, and that ends for the time being in Leeds, UK. Coffee Grove is where I'm from. It's a, a mountainside district in Manchester, Jamaica. Uh, Manchester uh, is one of our parishes. We, we won't dwell on that. Um, it's uh, 591, Coffee Grove is located 591 meters above sea level. It's uh, a cast limestone geology. It's quite apparent here that this area was once under the ocean. It's a uh, there's a regular array of round topped conical hills and uh, occasional sinkholes. But what sears the memory the most, uh, perhaps, is the scarlet red soil of Coffee Grove, that deep richness of red that denotes the presence of bauxite, which is abundant in these parts. It is rich agricultural soil. It's a Coffee Grove is a farming district, and that's what my grandmother did. My grandmother with whom I lived for the first five years of my life and with whom I'd spend each one of my vacations thereafter. We lived in a tiny one bedroom house on the brow of a hill, a one bedroom which my grandmother divided into two using a cloth covered wooden partition. It was not the most coveted patch of land. It was quite rocky. But as people do in this part of the world, she made the most of it, planting a few trees. There's a coconut that still stands there and under which my uh, navel string, i.e. umbilical cord, is planted. It was a very healthy lifestyle that we had good food, much of which we planted ourselves. We, our rain, or sorry, our drinking water was rainwater collected in tanks and drums. Uh, we lived to the circadian rhythms. There was no electricity when I, while I was growing up. But the thought that we were poor was never voiced. It, it seemed to be not quite a, a concept, the idea of poverty back then. Daytime was for work and play, nighttime was for sleep. That was the kind of village that it was. And thinking back as I have been for different perceptions of nature and what nature is, I've been going to common, <clears throat> pardon me, to tie up photos there, or to, to grow, as it was called it, the cultivation. The way she walked, one hand gripping an arm behind the back while of looking around. I didn't make much of it then, but I think about it now. I'm reminded also about this by my mother, who's probably on this call, who that mama, as we called her, that was the name of my, uh, uh, that, that's what I call my grandmother, 
always three or five, never an even number, because one of us was ill uh, or she was ill or just because it was um, perhaps the reason why she scared. Now I'm assuming that Jason is breaking up for yeah. everyone else. Jason, you're you're cutting out slightly. Um, I wonder if Rosie, you could confirm that that's the case at your end as well. Yeah, it is. Okay. Well, I think what I would suggest is that we we take a moment and perhaps we could, um, if Ben is ready to um, step in um, and do take a breather, Ben, if you need to. Uh, you could uh, begin. Um, I'll introduce Ben and uh, perhaps we will return to Jason if that's possible. Um, ben Mark writes for Harper's and for The New Yorker um, and is working on a, a book for Granta. Uh, he's been responsible for some of the most powerful reporting anywhere, I think, on the human rights crimes that are occurring in Xinjiang, China. And for this issue of Granta, he's written a, a really remarkable essay about a journey in the northern Philippines at a time of earthquakes of, of various different kinds. Um, and Ben has just days ago returned from a, a reporting trip to Iraq and Syria. So Ben, I'm especially grateful to you for joining us tonight and stepping in at such short notice. Of course, and thank you for having me. <clears throat> the steepest places have at all times been the asylum of liberty. This quote from the memoirs of the Hungarian Baron de Tat, who traveled across the Ottoman Empire, is immortalized, or immortalized for me, as I'd never heard of him, in Fernand Braudel's The Mediterranean and the Mediterranean World in the Age of Philip II, a really masterful work with a mouthful for a title that some of you may have come across. Raudel was writing about Mediterranean mountains, the mountains of Syria and of the Balkans, and their resistance to historic kingdoms and states compared to the neighboring lowland regions. But in my travels, I've found that the sentiment is still widespread today among people who understand themselves as Highlanders, especially in places where post-colonial states are fairly young or resource poor. People living in the mountains seem to feel freer more autonomous, better able to preserve local languages, customs, and social structures, whether they're in the Caucasus, in Kurdistan, or Kazakhstan, to name three other places I've visited in recent years to research and write about mountain life. Mountains are always peripheral to state cores. Until the latter half of the last century, most states, even those that were part of large colonies or empires uh, run from Europe or the United States, they didn't have the capacity to bring administration and authority into such high friction environments or to transform the erosional protest of the slope into fertile farms or mines for raw earth materials. On the contrary, mountains have more often served as zones of refuge. The Kurds have no friends but the mountains is a famous Kurdish saying that could apply to many peoples with no state sovereignty but with strong traditions of autonomy and difference making people who have sought asylums of liberty in high places. Today, I'll talk about my trip to the Cordillera Central Range in Northern Luzon in the Philippines, an area that has thwarted state capture by Spanish colonizers and American imperialists, and more recently by corrupt endemic regimes like those of Ferdinand Marcus, Marcos or Rodrigo Duterte. The people living there go by many names and speak many languages. The Spanish called them all Igorots, a term that probably means people of the mountains. I've learned that mountains require new ways of thinking about landscape. Locals and anthropologists who study mountain societies both know that mountain geography must be understood not from above as though reading a map, but as a lateral cross section since different peoples will have settled at different altitudes in order to exploit narrow stacked zones of agricultural and economic possibility. Viewed from above, mountain settlements may seem randomly scattered, 
But if you look at them horizontally, the wisdom of their organization becomes clear. Whether a community is growing rice or millet, or whether they're mining gold or harvesting opium. Likewise, paths that might appear inefficient when charted by outsiders might actually be designed to evade discovery by, in the case of the Cordillera, Spanish conquistadors or American shock troops. In my essay, I write about one American engineer and surveyor who dismissed the trails in the Cordillera as terrible and looked forward to a new American built road for automobiles. He blamed the ignorance of locals, but there's a well-established tradition in the Cordillera Mountains of communities hiding efficient transportation methods from the Spanish in order to derail their mining and missionary efforts. And they were successful. In the course of my research, I became electrified by the work of an anthropologist named James C. Scott, who writes about forms of resistance among disorganized, decentralized, and very remote peasant communities. Focusing on an area of mainland Southeast Asia, he refers to as Zomia. What they are resisting can be called broadly the state, hierarchical, top-heavy, often corrupt apparatuses of controlling, counting, assessing, and otherwise knowing large, unwieldy populations. They did this for the historical purposes of taxation, conscription, and claiming new territory. The better you know a people and the places where they live, the better you are able to extract resources from them, put them to service as corvée labor or soldiers, and ultimately claim control over the land they use. Granta's commission allowed me to write up some of my research and reporting into these subjects in a different form than what I'm used to, as a travelogue. I flew into Manila and within a few days, I had a memorable travelogue style introduction to Luzon, the eruption of Tall Volcano in January, 2020. I was traveling with my partner and one night the street we were staying on, all the cars and the trees and the, the plants were covered in this kind of film, this sort of very thin gray, silky film, um, which we only realized was ash when we got back to where we were staying and saw that parts of the building were closed down because of ash fall. One way mountains are known by their inhabitants is through their violence, through the difficulties they bring to people around them, whether volcanic activity or earthquakes, landslides. The eruption of Tall, 40 miles or so to the south of where we were staying in Manila, shut down the entire city. The government evacuated 20,000 people and eventually more than 100,000. Elsewhere, there were earthquakes, there was a polio outbreak in Manila, in uh, Mindanao, and there were some news stories about a novel virus in China that some people thought might spread to other countries in Asia. A friend told us we'd arrived in disaster season. So it was lucky we were heading into the mountains to the north, leaving the large alluvial plain around Manila. Scott describes how modern states have relied on distance demolishing technologies from all weather roads and airplanes to telephones and GPS, and that this has radically shrunk the peripheral non-state and autonomous world, although it has not quite vanished yet. Part of my goal was to listen to the stories of those distance demolishing efforts from below. That meant we had to get up into the mountains where the friction was high. Luzon's population at 62 million makes it the fourth most populous island in the world. So it's hardly an obscure little visited place, but most of those inhabitants live in cities in the south and in the center of the island, in the lowlands. Northern Luzon is very mountainous with three ranges shoved together and no lowlands between them. And some parts of it are accessible only by difficult roads, by once daily jeepneys, these are old US military jeeps that have been turned into buses, and in some villages by dirt road or horse track. It is by no means lubricated for the global economy as is the great port of Manila. It was winter, a warm but dry season in Northern Luzon and not a time when there are many tourists. So jeepneys were filled with locals and most of the hotels and restaurants in places like Sagada were closed for the season but we were able to meet with different people in villages and towns in the North and to hear from them their own histories of resistance and self-determination. I wanna tell just one of those stories. In Baguio City, a mountain town about five hours from Manila by bus filled with universities, it often felt like a city that was filled only with young people. I met a lifelong rights activist named Joanna Carino. Joanna came from an important family in Baguio and could trace her line back there many generations. As a college student, she had been tortured under the US-backed Marcos regime and illegally detained in a political concentration camp for two years during a period of martial law. 
In the camp, she learned about a project called the Chico River Dam that it threatened the entire ecosystem and economy of the Cordillera. Under Marcos, the country had secured investments from Europe to build at least 40 major dams over a 20 year period. A lot of the funding came from um, the World Bank. Almost all of the dams were planned for lands occupied by indigenous minorities. Seeing as water flows downhill, by design, they were planned for wide valleys in the mountains and would submerge all the best farmland in the mountain hamlets. The watersheds of the Philippines' major rivers, uh, mainly in Luzon, uh, were home at that time to one and a half million people. Some of the dams were built in the end and government and paramilitary forces terrorized the local population into leaving. But the Chico River Dam was a special case. It wasn't actually one dam, it was four giant hydroelectric, hydroelectric projects. If it had been completed, the Chico Dam would have been the largest in Asia, displacing tens of thousands of people and demolishing local economies and food supplies to bring about a thousand megawatts of power to Metro Manila. Joanna was radicalized over the decade long struggle against the Chico River Dam. Uh, as I said, she learned about the project during her detention um, towards the end of that two year period as indigenous people from deep in the mountains um, began to fill the detention camp. She was so shocked, she told me she was shocked to see some of them wearing traditional clothing made of felted bark and fronds. Although she was herself a member of the Ibaloi community, she had never seen people like this because the mountains were so inaccessible that they never came to Baguio and she had never been that far along the Chico. Some villages that the dam would submerge were so remote that they could not be reached by road. One woman who was a girl at the time the dam was announced remembered that to reach her barangay from the provincial road accessible to motor vehicles, she had to hike across two mountains or if the, the water level of the Chico River was low, hike the steep river bank for three or four hours. Joanna told me about visiting an early meeting of the People's Alliance that was formed against the dam after she was released from, uh, from prison. It was the rainy season and a river they needed to cross was flooded. And she described some of the large muscled members of the local tribe lifting the visitors, herself included, onto her shoulders and fording the raging river. This is to give you an idea of how remote this parts of these regions were and, and how cataclysmic this dam project appeared to them. And dams are interesting parts of stories like these I've found. Um, the early large hydropower mega dam projects that a lot of countries began to build uh, in the second half of the last century had an interesting effect uh, because unlike a mine or a plantation, their construction affects a huge geographic region all at once. And the shape of the affected territory isn't round or square, but extremely long and tree-like on a map. The entire course of a river and its tributaries can be forever changed. Many miles of valley may be flooded, transformed into a giant lake, and tens of thousands of people may be displaced by its construction. As a result, the prospect of a dam can bring together all the people who share a single waterway in the mountain. And I've heard this story from the Philippines to on the other side of the world in northernmost Norway, where resistance to the Alta Dam galvanized the indigenous Sami people across Satmi, which is also called Lapland, their ancestral territory. Through a decade of protest and direct action, communities along the Chico succeeded in killing the dam project. The struggle united for the first time, distant and remote communities up and down the Chico River into a single unprecedented block of resistance, culminating in a major victory for a philosophy of self-determination and land use that was only then becoming known as indigenous rights. In practice, as Joanne and others told me, activists used traditional social technologies such as peace pacts to create alliances between historically hostile tribes and communities and to align with both the region's Maoist communist insurgents as well as foreign NGOs in the UN, all of which allowed them to coordinate actions and protests against the Marcos regime. At the end of our journey, we followed the Chico River past villages that would have been drowned if it were not for the resistance against this dam decades ago and made our way up a mountaintop outside of Bontok, talking with young farmers in a small village called Malikong, where everywhere you looked, rice terraces extended as far as you could see. Rice terrace technology has existed here in the Cordillera for centuries and uses forests and irrigation techniques to sustain sustainably feed thousands of people. They are inherently a decentralized technology and are rarely the product of any chiefdom, kingdom, or state. Rather, a community must work together in concert to keep all of the family plots working together. 
My plot might sit right above yours, so you depend on my cooperation for irrigation, making sure you get the water you need, that I'm not polluting your plot with pesticides or things like that. The rice terraces in the Cordillera seem to have appeared after the arrival of the Spanish, not thousands of years ago, as was once thought. They are a reform of what is sometimes called escape agriculture and are an example of the observation that has often been made that those social and economic structures found in high mountains are more flexible and egalitarian than in hierarchical valley societies. It is hard to hold purchase on power here unless you hold it together. Thank you. Ben, thank you so much. Um, it would be impossible to put together a uh, an anthology of travel writing in 2021 without being concerned with the legacy of colonialism. But um, but your talk and your, your essay remind me that um, hand in hand with that legacy goes a legacy of indigenous resistance. I think we are gonna try and return um, to um, Jason uh, towards the end. Um, and we're hoping he has uh, resolved his connection problems. Um, and we're gonna move now to uh, Taran N. Khan. Um, Taran uh, is joining us from uh, Mumbai um, at about half past one in the morning. Um, her wonderful book, Shadow City, uh, A Woman Walks Kabul, won the Stanford Dolman Travel Book of the Year Award uh, last year. Um, in some ways, the essay she's written for Granta for this volume is a kind of companion piece to that, that wonderful book. Um, and it could hardly be more timely in terms of the questions it asks about travel, the questions of travel it asks. Um, about exile, about the violence of borders, and about who gets to cross those borders and who doesn't. Uh, Taran, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Will, and thank you to everyone who's listening. As Will said, quite late uh, at night in Mumbai, and I'm really pleased to be a part of this conversation with all of you in a way I think might not have been possible two years ago. And I think that's an interesting way to lead into the stories I want to tell you today, which are in fact about ways of listening, which are about people and cities that vanish and reappear in unexpected places, uh, which are about how when we are talking of travel, sometimes we might be describing borders and how what we think of as stories of travel may well shift depending on who is telling them and who is doing the listening. So the story I'm going to share with you today is about my friend Masood and about a road called Steinberg in Hamburg. I met Masood, uh, it's not his real name. I met him in Kabul over a decade ago. Masood had grown up in Iran as a refugee. And after 2001, his family decided to move back to Afghanistan for what they hoped would be the last time. Masood had never seen the city of Kabul, but he had always thought of it as his home. And when he got there, he began exploring it by making films. He was part of this uh, group of filmmakers of young, really talented, really resourceful people who I was so um, privileged to meet during my time in Afghanistan, where they were just committed to the idea of making films, whatever resources they could, and they overcame incredible obstacles to be able to tell these stories. My last trip to Afghanistan was in 2013. And around that time, many people who I knew either were talking of leaving or had already left because the next year was when the international coalition was supposed to formally end its combat operations in Afghanistan. Masood was one of the people who was part of that season of vanishing. Soon after that, I lost touch with him. My messages got no reply. I didn't know where he was, except that I knew he was somewhere in Europe. And then in 2018, uh, I was in Germany, in Hamburg, writing about Afghan refugees and asylum seekers. And Masood just came back to my life very simply with a text message offering to cook me an Afghan meal, a promise he had made all those years ago in Kabul. It was a strange time to meet him. Um, 2015 was when Europe had encountered what was often described as a refugee crisis. And the time when Masood and I were together in Hamburg, was already three years after this, and they have, there was already all kinds of responses. There was protests and counter protests to the number of asylum seekers that had been admitted in Germany. And with Masood, I got the feeling that while there was so much talk about refugees, the news was full of them and of other friends from Kabul who were also seeking asylum 
in different countries in Europe. They seemed to be everywhere. There was talk everywhere about refugees, but somehow Masood and the voices of people like Masood were missing from these conversations. Even though he was in the middle of all this discord, he was somehow invisible. So we were sometimes end up, sometimes with him, sometimes on my own, I would end up by the harbor in Hamburg, which is a really beautiful part of the city. And uh, it's an active port, so I would watch these ships come and go carrying goods. And it felt like watching a flow of things, of people that were welcome, that were visible, that were desired. Um, and then very often, sometimes with Masood, and again, sometimes on my own, I would end up in a, in a street called Steindam, which is not too far from the main railway station in Hamburg. The word Steindam means stone dam, and it's a long road and it changes character every few steps. It's about 900 meters long, so there are really beautiful old buildings in certain parts of it, which are so which have survived the war. And there are uh, old uh, variety theater, there is a cinema. Um, the part where I spent a lot of my time was close to the train station, and this was full of uh, grocery stores and restaurants serving so-called ethnic food, which included a lot of Turkish businesses, also Afghan, Indian, Syrian restaurants, grocery stores. There were shops that had displayed their wares out on the pavements. There were hijab shops and sex shops and hookah shops and cheap uh, airline, uh, cheap uh, travel agents selling airline tickets. Um, there was a, not so far from Steindam, there's a square called Hansa Platz where I saw a large number of drug users, there were sex workers, there were more police than I had seen in other parts of the city. And what one local journalist described to me about Steindam was I thought very telling. He said, everything that we're scared of, we put here, sex, migrants, and mosques. This was a part of the street where I would often be wandering, it was called derisively Donor Alley or the Dirty Mile. And it was also called Flying Kabul. I should mention that Hamburg has the largest population of Afghans in Europe. So this, watching this street, I got the feeling of a parallel river of sorts, except that here the flow was of people who were not entirely wanted, of people who were right there, but somehow on the margin, somehow invisible. I talked about Kabul a lot with Masood, partly because this, these were memories that we shared, and partly because his future was so uncertain and the present was so difficult because of the bureaucratic processes he was undergoing and that his family and his friends were undergoing. We ended up talking a lot of the past, and with these conversations, we conjured up a Kabul in Hamburg. And we could see the city glimmering the waterways of Hamburg and the peace of its evenings and the beautiful sky. And it reminded me in a way of Calvino's wonderful book, Invisible Cities, where Marco Polo, the traveler, is describing city after city after city to Kublai Khan. And we find that, in fact, he's describing the same city, which is Venice, the mother of cities, the one city that he loved the most, and which is, I think, perhaps what we do when we travel, is we cast what we know into the unknown, which is what Masood and I were perhaps doing. We were casting Kabul into Hamburg, which was a form of travel for both of us. In fact, when I would wander around Steindam and I would walk into coffee shops or into supermarkets or grocery stores, I would call myself a traveler, a musafir, which is a word that was understood incidentally by people who spoke Urdu and Arabic and Turkish and Persian. And that word opened many, many doors for me because a traveler has a certain claim on the hospitality of the people around him or her. And uh, when I said I was a musafir, I received this hospitality. I received cups of tea, I received pastries, I received advice, I received offers of help. And when I left, uh, often the people I was, speak was speaking to would say, come back anytime, this is your home. When Masood and people like Masood describe themselves, they used a different word. It's a word I find often in my notes from that period. They call themselves Muhajir, which is loosely translated as migrant. And in Masood's case, uh, it was a term that had no return journey because he told me that he had forfeited the right to return to Afghanistan and he had not seen his family for several years. In fact, he had 
no idea when he would be able to see them again. I thought a lot about the difference and the distance between these two words. And I think this is what I mean when I say that sometimes when we describe travel, we are describing borders. Because as an Indian woman, when I, when I go to Europe, the idea of invisible borders isn't particularly reassuring to me. In fact, they can sometimes make me quite nervous because borders rarely work to my advantage. I would rather see them coming. I would rather be prepared, which is something I do routinely when I have to travel and get to the airport early, earlier than I have to. I carry all the papers I can. I prepare answers to questions that I might be asked. I carried my passport around all the time in Hamburg, even though I was never asked to show it. And when I'm reading texts, when I'm reading books of travel, especially those written by writers living in the West, I'm very often struck by sentences that go something like, I found myself in China, or I was wandering through Turkey. And I'm so fascinated by the sense of ease these sentences seem to communicate, by the fluency and the spontaneity with which these figures are crossing borders, which is not my experience at all. And I'm also always struck by how there never seems to be the need to explain the presence of these figures in the places where they are. It seems quite natural that they would be there explaining the world to readers like me. But for Masood and for people like Masood, this is not the same. Uh, in fact, Masood not only needs to have a reason for being in Europe, his story needs to be consistent and his story needs to be compelling each time he tells it. Uh, even when I would be wandering around Hamburg and meeting other journalists or writers, very often I would also, also be asked in different intonations what exactly I was doing there, writing about Germany. One of the few places where I was not asked this question was in Steindam, and perhaps that's why I kept returning to its difficult and sometimes dingy spaces. On the suit's wall, in an arch, he had pasted photographs. Um, some of these were from Kabul, and some of these were from different places in Europe. And he had pasted them like a jigsaw puzzle, with white spaces in between. And looking at these pictures on an asylum seeker's wall, I was not sure whether we would describe them as images of travel or as trajectories of escape. And perhaps what Masood has realized in his journey, first from Iran to Afghanistan, and then from Afghanistan to Germany, is that the act of seeking refuge in a country that is far away from your own also means traveling a great distance from the person that you used to be. It means leaving behind the complexity of your story, your history, your music, all the flaws and all the contradictions that make you and embracing the persona of being a refugee. In the white space, it means existing in the white spaces in the photographs on his wall. And I think in those white spaces are questions like, when we are describing travel, are we describing borders? What is it that we, who is it that gets to tell stories of travel? And when we are listening to what we think are stories of travel, are we often just moving in one direction? During the pandemic, I think many of us got some degree of experience of the arbitrariness of borders and how they can appear suddenly um, in the most unexpected places. We got some experience of how little we can control our journeys and how often we end up in places where we may or may not want to be. A few months ago, this is where I would have ended the story. But in August, everything changed for Masood. The Taliban took over Afghanistan. Some members of his family were able to escape, and others are still in Kabul trying to find a way to leave. I talked about this to Masood, and while we talk, I remember the images of airplanes taking off on the shop fronts of Steindam. And I remember one afternoon that we spent, where we had gone out for lunch together, Masood and his wife, Narkis, and their two children, and another friend and his family. And we had walked through a road behind Steindam, 
uh, after lunch, we wanted to have ice cream. And Nargis had said that she knew a place where it was served exactly like it was in Kabul, where it came frozen in a tin foil container in creamy layers. So we went to look for this ice cream shop. And while we were walking, we saw a police officer examining the papers of a thin, short man and a woman who was standing next to him waiting patiently for this to get over. So there we were, six adults, three children, walking past the tableau. And as we passed, the question in my mind, and I think in my companion's mind, was would we be stopped and asked, what exactly were we doing there? Thank you very much for listening. Taran, thank you so much. Um, those two words, Musafir, Muhajir, traveler, migrant, and the invisible cities that can somehow evolve between them. Thank you. Um, it would be the case, of course, that um, this being Zoom, we have beautiful connections to Berlin and to Rhode Island and to Mumbai, but uh, we have trouble with our connection to uh, Leeds. However, I'm hoping, Jason, that you're going to be able to rejoin us and that we can rejoin you and your grandmother. I'm very sorry for the technological failure, which is absolutely on. I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap this up as succinctly as I can. Jason, take um, your time. Take your time. We'd love to hear the rest of it, please. <laughs> um, I think where I was in my story was um, with my grandmother walking through the woodlands. I, 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 I wanted to tell a story about walking and different ways of walking. Uh, she's going to common, as I said. Um, I was speaking about the way uh, people scan their surroundings there um, as if awaiting something, as if um, looking looking for something as a kind of um, engagement uh, or respect towards uh, trees and plants. That's uh, uh, not just scientific, um, it's not passive walking, it's not just about the rationality of what trees uh, are, why we need trees, but it's something more than that. It's something about the woodlands having power. Um, I think if I, uh, if you heard me, uh, uh, I was speaking about um, my grandmother uh, receiving dreams about the bushes that she should, she should gather. Uh, and, 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 and that also that contiguity between the dream world and the kind of waking world. Um, I, I, I was about to speak. So at five years old, I moved um, to live with my mother in a town called Porus. It's a small town located not too far from Coffee Grove. Um, and it represented progress. Uh, my mother was the first to leave the bush, as it were. Leaving the bush was um, something that a lot of people tried to do because that signified upward mobility. Um, and it makes me, uh, it, it, what, what I'm, uh, what that, I'm, that what I'm tracking there is how poor Jamaicans often have an ambivalent relationship to what, to what we call nature. Uh, it's nature, the, the, the woodlands, the, the, the green spaces are so important to us and to who we are, the ground, the soil is um, so important to who we are. But you're also trying to run away from that because it's also a reminder of days gone by of forced toil, forced labor, slavery, and uh, not so pleasant memories. So there is um, a, a desire often to, to conquer the bush as it were, to, to move away from it. Um, I remember as a child when the white environmentalist would come on TV, uh, we would often roll our eyes uh, because 
uh, that concern for nature was seen as a, a white or brown people thing. They, they talked about um, not cutting down, they talked about um, uh, against pollution, they talked about not cutting forests, they talked about um, not cutting forests, but we asked um, what, how, how do you build your big houses? They talk about um, pollution, but we talk about the, the um, how, do, how do you explain the big, um, the big cars and the, the SUVs and Range Rovers that you uh, have? In other words, we, it, it seemed there was a contradiction in that conversation uh, around nature uh, and we couldn't get our, our minds around it. What we, that, that, that social mobility uh, involved just moving uh, away from, from the green. So if Coffee Grove represented dwelling in the green, I suppose, Boros represented resisting the green. I did high school in Jamaica. I went to university in Kingston. I would eventually um, travel to England, to Oxford, um, to study there. And that experience was sort of the ultimate, uh, um, it was part <laughs> of the split away from, from the bush, as it were. It was a part of the, the process of conquering the bush. Um, so, so far, um, I'm, I'm trying to articulate then these different ways of perceiving nature. Here I am in England. I receive my doctorate from Oxford. I settle here. I become, uh, eventually uh, became a lecturer at in Leeds where I, I now live. Um, my partner and I have two children and in recent years, we purchased a home and we purchased a home in a very uh, leafy part of Leeds uh, where <clears throat> the woodland was on, uh, the park was on our doorstep, the, the woodland was there, it, 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 it's within a park. Um, so here I am, I'm back among the trees <laughs> and all of a sudden nature becomes a thing. And because of where I am, I realize how much the access to this sort of space also had been unavailable to me in this country before. That also was a pregnant realization. But here I am and I'm discovering walking and going for walks. Within Leeds, I realized that a different way of knowing nature is available. There's a different way of knowing nature. Um, and very often it's about knowing the names of things, having facts, having science, uh, knowing the purpose of the trees. It's often a kind of, uh, a sort of knowing that kind of thing. But I also realize that nature is a space you go into, an alternative space where you go to find yourself. It's a, a sort of a place of escape from the city. People go into nature walking so fast, often, that is, there are people who go into nature to, to um, walk their canine critters. There are people who hardly look up or down. And all of a sudden, I am looking back at Coffee Grove and at that way of walking. I'm looking back at what nature, uh, as, nature as a way of listening to things, a way of keying into the power and the agency of things. That kind of scanning and expectancy and awaiting and even a bit of uncertainty that comes from a kind of encounter with the space. And now I'm giving life to that curiosity. And that also is uh, a way, that is also, I realize, a way of perceiving what nature is. Um, so that's uh, the, the question of what is nature and what is the green that intersects issues of um, class, um, race, um, um, 
perhaps gender and all of these, these concerns. But in the end, I'm struck by how you can see a thing when you embark on the journey and how you see it when you arrive, so to speak. And I hope that is the story. Thank you. I hope that my internet held up throughout all of that. Held up beautifully, Jason. Thank you so much for taking us on that journey from one kind of green to another kind of green, one kind of nature to another kind of nature and for bearing with the, uh, the technical interruption midway through. Um, we are drawing to a close. I'm gonna hand back to Rosie very shortly. I mentioned uh, one of the contributors to that 1984 edition of Granter, Jan Morris. And I just wanna read something that Jan Morris said in an interview. And she said, for her travel had been a search for reconciliation with nature, but with people too a pursuit of unity, and even an attempt to contribute to a sense of unity. And while I'm feeling optimistic, um, that's my answer to the question on the cover of this issue of Granta, should we have stayed at home? Um, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you to Granta. Thanks above all to our speakers, to Bafshi Bittemouf, Jason Allen Paisant, uh, Ben Mork, Taryn N. Khan, uh, and of course, um, Rosie, thank you very much. Thank you to five by 15. Thank you so much, Will. Um, that was just a wonderful hour. I couldn't have enjoyed myself more and I'm sorry about the internet, but in fact, it didn't matter one bit by the time we got there. That was a great talk, Jason, as was, as were all the others. And Will, thank you very much for editing this fantastic issue of Granta. We much look forward to your book next year and to, from me to all of you, thank you very much on our behalf and from five by 15, good night and join us again soon. We'll be back again next week with more wonderful things for you to listen to so on that note good night and thank you